Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope. And we are in the Book of John series. We're on a part 235. We are in the heading, The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit, part 17, and we are currently in John 14, 26, excuse me, as our expository teaching goes. And we are currently uh, past the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and we've kind of worked ourselves to the blas uh, the term blasphemy and how we blaspheme God every day in vain um, in our society and in our way of life, and most of us don't even think about it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover some things to, to bring to knowledge some truth. That way we can make objective decisions about our speech and communication that we use every day. I think this would be helpful. I think this would be great in the Holy Spirit study because certainly if you are spirit filled, you are not going to be using the Lord's name in vain. Uh, certainly that would be a something that each and every one of us should get a should it should result in in a conviction when being convinced through the Word of God and how the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to bring about conviction in the believer as well as the unbeliever. So let's go ahead and, and do this. Uh, we're going to first hit John 14, 26 in the King James Bible. Let's look at it. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said un unto you. Now, don't you think that if you would learn uh, some truths like this out of the Holy Bible, that there would be some holiness coming from the Holy Bible as you try to learn it and put it in your memory and things could be brought to remembrance by the Holy Ghost as he teaches you things out of the Holy Bible concerning holiness and holy living out of the Holy Bible? <laughs> Certainly, right? Sure, sure. We we could assume that. That would be a, a rational thing to state. That would be a reasonable thing to state. So let's go ahead and do this. Um, we're going to um, we're going to talk about words that blaspheme God that are used as everyday jargon and or talk expressing surprise or disgust. And our communication should be holy, right? Colossians 3.8, let's look at that. But now ye also put off all these. Now, what does put off mean? It means, means get them away from you. Stop practicing those things. Get rid of those things. Put those things to death, so to speak. Okay, but now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice. Now look, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Why do people see? See, we're talking about anger, right? Now everybody gets angry, but the Bible says, "Be ye angry and sin not." So it is possible to be angry, but I think in Colossians three eight is talking about people that are angry and sinning. <laughs> it's not the anger that you're not sinning. And that's hard to do. It's hard to be angry and not sin. So the Bible's talking about the kind of anger that would bring about sin, right? So there's nothing wrong with being angry as long as you're not sinning. But if you're angry and you're sinning, you need to put this off, right? Then it's wrath, right? None of us, none of us can deal in wrath righteously. Every time we're wrathful, Man, we, bring, we, we go overboard. We're talking about revenge. We're talking about vengeance. We're talking about all these things, and we go overboard. We do overkill when we, when we deal in our wrath. That's why God says we're not responsible when we're wrathful. So you've got to leave wrath up to God because when God uses his wrath, it's righteous wrath. So God, so God says, uh, you know, obviously Paul is the one writing here under the divine inspiration of the Holy Ghost. But now ye also put off the, all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. So you see this blasphemy. Is that all kinds of blasphemy? Even the kind that I use that I don't think is serious? Yes, all blasphemy. And then, and then look, you, you wouldn't think you'd have to say this to a saved person, filthy communication. 
You know, we got you got Christians using the F word, Christians using four letter words in their daily talk. And one minute they'll talk about Jesus in the Bible. The next minute they're using foul language, filthy communication. They, they coarse joke, meaning they tell uh, dirty, dirty jokes uh, with sexual innuendos, uh, uh, talking about sexual immorality, filthy communication. We're to be holy. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Does the Holy Spirit direct us to the Holy Bible? Are we not supposed to be holy vessels unto the Lord? Holiness, to be whole, to be righteous. Look, none of us, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. But Jesus has made you righteous. Should we not strive every day for righteousness in Christ? We should. To people stuck in their filthy communication. Man, it's, it's a disgrace when you talk to some Christians. Some Christians cannot control their mouths. They are so foul that you would be more blessed and more holy just not talking to them at all. Nobody wants to hear your filthy communications. If you don't have anything good to say, don't say it at all. No, but I got to tell you this dirty joke. It's so funny when you hear it. I don't want to hear your dirty joke. But 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 you're going to laugh. I don't want to hear your dirty joke. You see... And then you ask, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. But I just, come on, don't, don't, don't judge. Don't judge. You know what the Bible says about judging. Well, the Bible says you are to put off filthy communication. Are you calling the Bible wrong? Well, no, no. See, not, now you're judging. I'm like, I'm, I'm telling you what God says. If you're a Christian, you need to be putting off this filthy communication out of your mouth. People can't do it because that's how they live every day. Look, what comes out of your mouth, what comes out of your heart is a reflection of what you're filled with every day. It's what you're filled with every week. It's what you're filled with every month. It's what you're filled with every year. It's what you're full of. When all you got is filthy communication, that tells me what you're filled with, filthiness. You know when you have blasphemy? When you always blaspheme God, when you're always, oh my God, oh my goodness, it tells me you're filled with blasphemy. It's what you're filled with. The Bible says we ought not be filled with this. It says put off those things. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Will you put off the old man, put him to death? I'm not saying go kill yourself. I'm saying, will you stop doing these things? That's a, it's a, it's a representation of putting to death the old man. When you stop doing these things of anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. See, that's what it is. And then it tells you, yeah, stop doing those things. People always are, are all about, well, the Bible is all about not doing this and not doing that. And that's, that's all Christianity is about is you can't do all these things. But look at verse 10. You want to complain about, well, you, got, you can't do all these things. Look at what you can do and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You could put on the new man and all the attributes that come with the new man, all the righteous living that comes with the new man, all the knowledge that comes with the new man, and we can look to God, the image of him that created him. Or, or we are the image of him that created him. See, we can look to the image of God. Now, 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 look at this. Uh, we did that. Now, go to Romans 8, 29. Go to Romans chapter 8 and go down to verse 29 here. Now, look at this. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be what? To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So, our goal after we're saved is to be predestinated. It, it's, it's the moment you're saved, God wants you to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's what we need to be doing. And by putting off the old man and putting on the new man and every day yielding to the word of God, every day yielding to the righteous living that we're supposed to be doing in Christian conduct concerning the word of God, the holy scriptures, we can end up living these these holy lives that may not be completely perfect, but every day getting closer and closer to be conformed to the image of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm a work in progress, but that's not a justification to not work anymore in the progression to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We can't use Romans 3.23 as a cop-out, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, as a cop-out to not strive for being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So how does this tie in the blasphemy? Well, you need to stop doing the old things you've always been doing. And a lot of us blaspheme God and don't even realize what we're doing. And every day we need to correct things, whether they're big things or small things, and get rid of these old things and put on the new things of Christ. The correct speech, correct action, correct conduct, correct imaginations, correct thoughts. See, that's what we're talking about. And it takes work. It doesn't come overnight. It's constantly a yielding process. But do you even have a desire to yield? That's the question we're asking. So uh, let's go ahead and dive into this. So our communication should be holy, Colossians 3.8 and Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that I may minister grace unto the ears. Building people up. That's what edifying is. Building people up. Are you ministering grace or are you ministering blasphemy? Are you ministering grace unto the ears or are you ministering um, corrupt communication? Are you ministering grace unto the ears or are you ministering filthy communication? What are you ministering to the ears? We need to minister grace. And to do that, is by not letting any corrupt communication proceed out of our mouths. No foul language. Yes, uh, even when you're angry, no foul language. But that which is good to the use of edifying. So if we don't have anything good to say, don't say it if it ain't going to edify anybody. We're talking about edifying, not rebuking. So we don't want to corrupt. I mean, and again, rebuking has its place. But we want to make sure that we're not just out there just acting like the world and not thinking of the words that we're speaking. Yes, words do hurt people. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That is the most untruthful statement that was ever made. Sticks and stones can break your bones and names do hurt you. We need to watch our mouths. We need to watch what we say. We need to not let any corrupt communication or any filthy communication proceed out of our mouths. We need to watch what we say and make sure that what we say is a reflection of what we're filled with on the inside. Amen. How about that? So, yeah, now, now, now let's do this. Let's do this. I'm going to flip the screen here. Now we're going to talk about some words that people use in vain. Okay, words that people use in vain. And let's talk about this first one here. You know, you ever had somebody tell you to go to hell? Go to hell. And, and you, you, know, you know what they'll say instead of go to hell? It, you know, if they're really, really angry at you, they're not going to tell you to go to the graveyard. They're not going to tell you, go to, the, go to the ground or go to jail or go to prison. I'm so angry at you. Go to Disneyland. Go to the Smithsonian. Go to college. You know, that would be a punishment, wouldn't it? Or they'll say, go to limbo. You know, even the people that believe in limbo, they don't, they don't tell you to go to limbo. Where, where, where do they tell you to go if they want to go for you? They're so angry at you. And the and they're trying to think of the worst place that is the that, that, that's, that can be possibly conceived in human thought and reasoning. You know where they tell you to go? They tell you to go to hell. You know, you know what they do? Instead of saying, what the hell, you know what they say? They say, what the heck? Now, I can say these words because these words are in the Bible, and I'm teaching you how not to say them. So I'm not using these in vain as I'm teaching you them to you, okay? So what the heck, the 
correct slogan is hell, right? What the hell? That's what people want to say. Well, why do they say what the heck? Because they want to consider hell a bad word. Hell is not a bad word. Hell is a place where people go for temporary imprisonment. That's what hell is. Hell is in the Bible. Jesus preached on hell more than any other doctrine in the Bible. And so hell is a real place, but you know what people do? You know why people feel guilty? Because they use it and they don't understand what hell is. They tell people to go to the eternal or, or one of the places that God has established for um, temporary punishment. And then they want to just use it in vain as if it means it's meaningless. It means nothing. But then it does mean something when they're really, really angry at you. So when someone is angry and they want to tell them the worst thing they can think of, they don't, they don't tell them to go anywhere else but hell. See? So you tell them to go to hell, Matthew 10, 28 says. Now watch this. Look at Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You see that? So hell is a real place. It's not a bad word. You know, there's kids that'll look at you crazy when you use the word hell as you're street preaching or you're, you're at a house witnessing to somebody and then you, you, you use the word hell and the kids go, ooh. The only way anyone can go to hell is if they reject the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not if someone tells them to go there. See how you can use that in vain? You are not to tell people to go to hell when you don't understand what hell is. And if you're saved, what are you doing telling people to go to hell? You need to tell people to believe the gospel so they don't have to go to hell. See the problem there? Hell is the eternal, I'll say one of the eternal abodes because a death and hell will, will be cast into the lake of fire where they'll be for eternity. But Hell is one of the eternal abodes for those that reject the gospel. So you can see how serious it is when you tell somebody to go to hell. It means they didn't believe the gospel. But you never preached to them the gospel because you were too busy getting angry at them, telling them to go to hell. And this is what we talked about. Remember earlier we talked about wrath? We talked about wrath. You know, man doesn't know how to use wrath correctly because their wrath is always sinful. You know what man does when they get angry at somebody? Sometimes even over trivial things or somebody cutting them off off the road. They tell them to go to hell. Yeah, praise the Lord that we don't have to be judged by your wrath and that God's wrath is going to override your wrath. That's right. God's wrath is what matters, not yours. Because if it was up to you, I would be in hell right now. Well, praise the Lord. We got Jesus Christ who died for our sins and rose again the third day. So none of us would have to go to hell if we believe on him. So watch out when you tell people to go to hell. You don't understand what it is. Don't use it if you don't understand it. Especially as a Christian, when you start understanding hell, why would you tell anybody to go there in vain? Shame on you. Point two. You know, somebody telling you. Now, now, now look at this. Uh, go to Mark 16, 16. Now, let's read this before I make my comment. He that believeth, now, 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 what is he believing? Look at 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be what? Saved. Now, now look, at the, look at the second half. But he that believeth not shall be what? Shall be what? Damned. So damned isn't a bad word. It's what's going to happen to you if you reject the gospel. So watch this. When somebody tells you, now, now mind you, I'm saying the words here, but the words are scriptural. When somebody says, God damn you. And you can see everybody snickering and everybody laughing. Ooh, look at what that preacher said. Now, now, now look, we just read Mark 16, 16. He that believeth not shall be what? Damned. That is God damning you. You see that? God damn you should never be used in vain. It should only be used in the scriptural context of trying to edify somebody about why they need to believe on Jesus Christ. No one can make God damn anybody. People are damned by God when they reject the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see that? It's very important. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2.12. 
that, uh, uh, look at verse 11. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion and they should believe a lie that they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see that? What happens after the rapture comes? God's going to send those that are left behind strong delusion and they're going to believe a lie. And what's going to happen? That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. They didn't believe the truth, therefore they're damned. So what is God doing? God is damning them. Shame on you if you're going to try to make like God is going to damn somebody by telling them that. Shame on you for your ignorance. Shame on you for your presumptuous ignorance. Your willingful ignorance. Uh, you, know, you know, today in America, people have no excuse not to know these things. Anybody in America, most, uh, let me just say, I want to be fair. Most everybody in America can have access to a holy Bible. And they can learn these truths. So nobody got an excuse to say, I didn't know. And you know what? When people say this, you know, you know, people say, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll say, God damn you. And then they'll close their mouth. Like, oops, I didn't mean to say that around you. You know why? Because they know it's wrong to do that. There's something within man that knows that they shouldn't be using these things in vain. All right, let's do another one. Go to Ezra 9, 6. You ever heard anybody say, oh my God? Look at Ezra 9, 6, and said, let's go back a verse here. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up into the heavens. Ezra uses the term, look at it, look at this, uses the term, i got to highlight it in blue for you, he uses the term, oh my God, only in reference to his repentance toward God and his godly sorrow because of his sin. You see that? It's the only time the context of oh my God is being used. Any other context is sinful, it's blasphemy, it's using the Lord's name in vain. When you say, oh my God, to express surprise or disgust, you are blaspheming the name of the Lord, and he will not hold you guiltless, even if you're saved. He'll not take away your salvation, but he will not hold you guiltless. Don't use the Lord's name in vain. Stop saying, oh my God. Stop saying, OMG. OMG is the same thing. You're just abbreviating it. It means the same thing. Oh my gosh. Changing the S and the H doesn't change what, what the intentions are of the phrase. It's a figure of speech. My question to you is, who's the figure in the speech? See, that's the figure you're blaspheming. So yeah, even in your argument of it being a figure of speech comes crashing down on you. Okay, so let's do another one. Look at Ephesians 4.32. You ever heard anybody say, for Christ's sake, for Christ's sake, stop doing that. Okay, that is really, you're going to use, that. people that are Christians use this. It's wicked. Don't be using this. Shame on you. I mean, you got to call shame or there's shame. Hold on, let me move up. Let me move up the, uh, able to see the bottom there. Okay, so let me scroll down a little bit more here. There you can see it. And look what it says in Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for what? For what? For Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Do you see for Christ's sake right there? You see that? For Christ's sake. Paul is using it correctly right there. The Holy Spirit is using it correctly right there. No blasphemy going on there. Now, the definition of sake, what does sake mean? Does anybody know what sake means? The word sake. Well, you, you, you can use it all the time, for Christ's sake, for Christ's sake, for Christ's sake. You can use it in vain all the time, but you don't even know what the word sake means. Shame on you. 
You just say things because everybody else says them. And you say them all ignorantly. See, you know what? You know, a lot of people are going to end up in hell because they're following everybody else into hell. They're not going to say, well, why, why, why am I going this direction towards hell? Why don't I turn around and put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ? You know, they just follow everybody ignorantly. They never ask any questions. So look, for Christ's sake, what does sake mean? Sake means final cause or purpose. Final cause or purpose for Christ's final cause or purposes. See that? For Christ's final cause or purpose have forgiven you. See that? For Christ's sake. What is Christ's final cause or purpose? When he died on the cross for your sins and rose again the third day. How wicked is that? That you would use Christ's final cause and purpose as blasphemy, as vain, as meaningless in your life. And people do it all the time. So, the Bible says that Christ's sake is dealing with the fact that he died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried and rose again the third day, which makes it possible for you to be forgiven if you believe the gospel. Right? Now, let's do another one. Because pe people are confused about this. They, they don't think they're, they're saying anything wrong when they say these words. When, in fact, they're blaspheming God. Look at Matthew 5, 34 to 37. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. We said this, we already quoted this verse before. Nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by the head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. Look at verse 37. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. You see that? Now, look at what it says on the very top. Uh, but I say, and you swear not at all. Now watch, neither by heaven. Now, now let's do one. Let's do one here. You ready? For heaven's sake. For heaven's sake. And, and we just read it. Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. For heaven's purpose, right? For heaven's final purpose is what they're swearing by. So what we need to do is stop saying for heaven's sake. We need to let our yea be yea and our nay be nay. When I tell you something, I don't need for heaven's sake. I just need to tell you I'm doing something. For heaven's sake, will you listen to me? You don't need to say stuff like that, okay? Okay, you ready for this? We'll do another one. Psalm 25, 7. Go there. Psalm get. Psalm 25, 7. So go down to verse 7 there. So there it is. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for what? Thy goodness sake, O Lord. Wait a minute. You ever use the word for goodness sake? The only time in the Bible where goodness sake is used is David, David talking about God not remembering his transgressions and sins no more because of the sake, the final purpose of his goodness. Why would you use for goodness sake? But yet people use it every day in, in, to express surprise. Uh, they'll use for goodness sake to express some kind of a, of a, of a vain thing that they're going to say. All right, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Look at John 13, 37. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. You ready for this? For Pete's sake. For Pete's sake. Would you just stop already? For Pete, for Pete's sake, you mean Peter? For Peter's sake? You see that Pete wanted to lay down his life for Jesus' sake. In John 13, 37, Peter said unto him, Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. 
And then look at verse 38. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Why would you say for Pete's sake when Pete couldn't even do anything for Christ's sake? Stop using that. Stop using for Pete's sake. You are blaspheming the name of the Lord. You want to show you something too. Look at Romans chapter 10. And I want you to go to verse 8. Go to verse 8. And um, I want you to, let's couple this with uh, verse 5. So we're going to go verse 5 and verse 8. Now, now look at verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Then he talks about the righteousness which is of faith, speaketh on this wise. So he went from the righteousness of the law, and if you're going to do the law, you're going to, you're going to have to live by all the law. And anything you violate, you'll be judged by the law. And anything you offend in one point, you'll be guilty of all. So you're going to live by the law. You're going to die by the law. You, you better get more than the law because the law can't save you. But look, the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. And then it goes right into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, well, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But then it's talking about the topic of the righteousness which is of faith. And it's speaking on this wise, right? Now, I want you to pay attention to verse 8. But what saith it? So you would ask the question, what, what is the it right there? That's why I had to go through those other passages. The it is the righteousness which is of faith, right? So, but what saith it? What saith the righteousness which is of faith? You get ready for this. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Do you know, think about this. Do you know that every time you use the Lord's name in vain, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That word of blasphemy that you're giving, that you're, you're disrespecting and dishonoring God, is dealing with the salvation that you need. It's dealing with the salvation that we preach. And it's in your heart. It's there in your heart. You're just blaspheming the very gospel that you don't even understand. The word is nigh thee. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Now, now let's go back. Let's go back. Pete's sake was dealing with Christ's sake. Pete's purpose was dealing with Christ's purpose. And when you use, and you say for Pete's sake... You're blaspheming Christ. What a shame. Let's not blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not blaspheme anything that deals in the word of God. Okay? So, let me give you another one. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody, anybody ever use that? I don't mean like God bless you, like you're just you know, praying for somebody that God would bless them. I'm talking about after somebody sneezes. You ever said God bless you after somebody sneezes? Here's my question to you. What happens if somebody never sneezes in their lives? Will God never bless them? Does God bless according to your sneezing? How come you can only bless people when somebody sneezes? You can't bless them by giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ so they can be saved. Look, somebody sneezing and you saying God bless you is, isn't going to get them saved, isn't going to do anything for them. You know how God blesses according to your salvation in Christ and obedience to his word, not by not sneezing or by, or by sneezing, okay? Now, let me give you a blessing here. Acts 3.26. Unto you first, look at the bottom of the screen, unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. See, that's a blessing. You want, if somebody's turning away from their iniquities, you, you can tell them God is blessing you. God is blessing you. 
All right, so we're going to stop on God Bless You, point eight. And when we come back on the next broadcast, we're going to talk a little bit more about more words. Um, we're going we're gonna to really get into the name of Jesus Christ that people use in vain. And we're going to discuss a little bit of that in the word Jesus alone and Christ and good Lord and holy, holy cow. We're going to talk about all of these different words. And then we're going to show you in the Bible why you shouldn't be using those words in vain. You can use them in the Bible. You can use them correctly if you're teaching somebody something or you're trying to present the gospel. But stop using those things in vain. That's what, that's what we're trying to, to show you here, okay? So there it is. Ho hopefully that, that's, that's a blessing, you know? When we talk about blessing, we mean you're hearing it and you're doing something with it. And then after you do something with it, then your life will be blessed. That's what we mean, we mean by blessing. So stop using those words. Look, we already gave you a list of words already. We gave you eight points. Um, that's already eight truths concerning the light that you received on this broadcast that can help you to work on not doing that anymore. I'm not saying these things aren't forgivable. I'm saying repent, repent to God. Uh, first John chapter one says, um, if we um, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's all you got to do. You use these words, just repent. Say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry I, I used these words. I'm going to change. I'm going to try to do better in my life. And I'm going to practice starting right now, God. And that's, when you when you say right now, that means you're repenting. That's what repentance is. It's turning right now from whatever you're doing and turning around. Why don't you do that? as a saved member of the body of Christ. And if you're lost today, look, all that blasphemy isn't, it, if you stop blaspheming today, you're still going to die and go to hell. What you need is to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again a third day for the salvation of your soul. And if you do that, you're saved. And you wouldn't commit the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, point one. And then point two, you can now start working on not blaspheming these words that we're talking about right now, which have no bearing upon the salvation of your soul. But it would be good to honor the one who loved us enough to die for our sins and rise again a third day. And I want to close out with this with this verse right here. I uh, just want this one verse here. It, this will be very helpful. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Dealing with saved members of the body of Christ. I beseech you therefore brethren. So that's saved members of the body of Christ. Paul is beseeching you. I don't know why he would have to beseech us because beseeching is another word for begging. I mean, that's what it means. It means he's begging you therefore by the mercies of God. Come on, when we look back at the mercies of God, what do we find? We find the cross work of Jesus Christ. And by looking at the cross work of Jesus Christ, there would be no need for Paul to beg us to do this. Because certainly every Christian that's a brethren would look at the mercies of God and say, Paul, you need to stop begging here. You just, just tell me what you got to say. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why is it our reasonable service? Did we all not receive the mercies of God? Did we not all have the cross work of Jesus Christ and have believed on that for the salvation of our souls? Why is it so hard to make your body and present your body a living sacrifice? Why is it so hard to be holy? Why is it so hard to be acceptable unto God when Jesus paid it all for your sins? It's our reasonable service. But you know what we do? We don't want to present our bodies a living sacrifice. We don't think it's a big deal. We don't think holiness is a big deal or being acceptable unto God is a big deal. And therefore, we can't even do our reasonable service. We're not even being reasonable Christians. Why don't we start being reasonable Christians and, and stop letting Paul beg you in Romans 12, 1, and let's just present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Let's do that. Amen. Let's honor Jesus Christ, not only in our, in, our, in our actions in our lives, but also with our words and not blaspheme the name of the God who loved you enough to die for your sins. All right, there it is. Um, we did um, eight points there, and I think we did good. Uh, you know, got this broadcast in a uh, very important uh, part of our, our study concerning the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's not going to uh, dwell within a believer and 
and bless that believer if he's constantly using the Lord's name in vain and blaspheming the Lord all the time. I mean, there's no way the Holy Spirit can work in that Christian's life. And think about it. That's just one conduct we're talking about. And we've got a lot of things that, that we need to work on in our Christian conduct. This is one of many. And so let's let's all, I mean, we have to have a starting point. Let's start somewhere and start working on lining our lives up with the Word of God, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and end it here. I hope to catch you on the next one. We'll continue on with our study on these specific blasphemous words that people take out of the Bible that are not used the way God wants you to use them. So thank you for joining me. I'm going to end it there. Uh, thank you for joining me. Book of John uh, series part 235. This is the person and work of the Holy Spirit part 17. And we are currently in John 14, 26. That's where we're currently at in our expository teaching. And I'm going to end it with that. Um, my name is Brother Ed. Thank you for joining me on KJV Bible Scope. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.